Okay, so the last time um, we discussed brain and behavior. So what I've projected at the moment is when you what, when you open or you crack the skull, okay, and you get to the meninges, and you also crack the meninges. So this is how the brain looks like. The moment you open the skull, this is how the brain looks. So when you open it like this, um, you can see that the brain can be divided into four, four sections. That's the lobes, L-O-B-E-S. What's the last time we discussed? So the moment you open the skull, you can see the brain in four different sections. So the pink color is the frontal loop. Then the blue color is the parietal, green, occipital. Then uh, I don't know what this color is. I think it's either um, brown, it's either cream. Yeah, I think cream or so. So the cream color is what? Is the temporal loop. So, so this is how the, the brain looks like. And we've already talked about the functions of each part. So when it gets, when you go through what the frontal lobe, we have the prefrontal cortex, where last time we, we talked about. So what's the function of the prefrontal cortex? Please, if, if you have an idea, you can raise up your hand. I want to look one or two people, then that's it. We move on. Yeah. Okay, some more. Uh, for reasoning and then cognitive, activities exactly so the prefrontal cortex will place a lot of role so we normally see that it plays some complex activities okay so abstract thinking that we can find a prefrontal cortex playing that then also we normally say that it is the executive function it is the executive function of the brain in a sense that it controls our decision making how to plan and all that and one key thing is that it also, we normally say that it is the working memory. It means that it what? Um, it helps us to what? It helps us to recall recent events and information. Yet at the same time, we normally say that it controls impulsive behaviors. Mm -hmm. It controls impulsive behaviors. There are certain behaviors maybe within our context, it is what? It is bad for, for someone to do. So for instance, within our context, it is bad for you to what? For you to um, place maybe sexual scenes or something within the public, right? So it means that your prefrontal cortex would what? Would inhibit you from what? From engaging in that act. So that's what we, we say, impulsive behavior. So it's what? It would inhibit you from engaging in that's kind of impulsive what? Act. All right. Then um, we also talk about the Brookes area. The Brookes area. Then we, we say that it plays an important role when it comes to what? Expression of speech, right? Or maybe you trying to what it is. We normally say it is the center for speech articulation, something like that, where we say that, oh, Basically, it re regulates what our speech production. That's what the Brookes area does. And this is where you can find it. You can find it, a, a large portion of it can be found within the frontal loop. Then a small portion of it can be found within the temporal loop. So in books, they normally say that the Brookes area is found within the frontal loop. Why? Because a large portion of it is found there. That's why. All right. Then the next one is the, what, the temporal loop. So as I said, the cream color is a temporal, okay? Then the temporal, it plays a lot of functions. Sometimes it plays a role when it comes to speech. Also, it plays a role when it comes to what? It comes to emotions. It regulates our emotions because you can find the amygdala within the temporal loop. So within the temporal loop, we have this structure known as the venicus area this thing, the venicus area, where we say that it helps us to, uh, to underst understand speech. It helps us to comprehend speech. And I talk about the fact that a lesion in Brookes area could lead to what kind of disorder? 
So someone should raise up his or her hand so that I'll call. Since most of you have you unmuted yourself. So please raise up your hand, then I'll call you. Then you answer. So a lesion or a damage. When I say lesion, it means damage. A damage within the brokerage area will cause what kind of disorder? Please uh, mute, uh, raise up your hand if you want to speak. All right. So last time, what we what I said was that a lesion in the brokerage area could lead to what is normally referred to as what? Someone's, okay, Samuel, your hand is up. I said, Samuel, your hand is up. So kindly unmute your mic and speak. It leaves the person not to speak. He cannot give out speech. Yeah, so what kind of, what, what's, what's the disorder, the term? So we call broker aphasia. Exactly. Broker aphasia. aphasia. Yes. Broker's aphasia. Good. So it means that a lesion, a lesion in their heart, in their broker's area could lead to broker's aphasia, whereby the person will have difficulties what expressing what fluent or yes expression expression um speech fluently so please i told you to mute all of you to mute yourself i mute all of you then you will mute yourself which is really bad or else you will interrupt whatever is, is going on here all right then the next one is venicis area damage in the venicis area could also lead to what venicis aphasia whereby the person will have difficulties understanding speech. All right. So we've uh, we've talked about all these things. I just want to uh, I just want to revisit them, revise them with you. Then um, the we are moving on to uh, to the the blue one, which is the parietal loop. The parietal loop. And before I move on to the blue one, let me go back to the frontal loop, the pink one. There's this structure, this structure, which is referred to as the precentral gyrus or sometimes known as the primary motor cortex. So we, we call it precentral gyrus or primary motor cortex. This. We also discussed that, that the last time. So please do remember what we said when it comes to the primary motor cortex or the precentral pre gyrus. So please, let's be snappy about this. We've already discussed this. We did it last time. All right, lovely. Please unmute your mic and speak. Please, you said it helps in balancing and post shock. Oh, okay, I think lovely. That one will be for the um, cerebrum. So, sorry, the cerebellum, the cerebellum, the little brain. That will be for balance and posture. All right. So Emmanuel, Emmanuel, please unmute your mic and speak. Yeah. Okay. 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 You said it is responsible for the fine motor movement. Okay, so I said it is responsible for what? For voluntary movements, okay? So when I say voluntary movement, for you to work, for you, for you to walk, okay? For you to manipulate whatever object, or for you to move your limbs, that's your legs your and, and your hands, or you reaching out for objects, all of them, for you to do that, it is due to your what? Your primary motor cortex, because you are doing it consciously. So that's what I mean by voluntary. All right. Then the next structure is what? Is um, the parietal lobe, which is the blue one. All right, so with the blue structure, the first area that we can find is this. Okay, this, and we call this structure what? The primary sensory cortex or sometimes referred to as the post-central gyrus. Or, or sometimes we call it the primary somatosensory. It means the same thing, primary somatosensory cortex. All right. So um, who remembers what we said when it comes to the primary somatosensory cortex? 
or the push central gyros. All right, lovely. Your hand is up. For sensation. Yes, so we know what we said it is what it receives majority of the somatic sensory. So it means it has a lot of receptive area for sense of touch. So I remember I indicated that, okay, whenever um, someone touch you, you can what? You can feel it. You have that sort of what? You can feel that someone has touched you. Or you have any what? Whatever um, sexual um, intercourse that you're having, you can feel it. Or someone is what? It's two partners are, what, are kissing, right? They can what? They can have that sort of what? Sense of touch. All these things, it means that they are, they are primary somatosensory cortex are, what, are active, helping them to, what, to have that sort of touch sensations. All right. Then the last one is what is the green lobe. The green lobe known as the occipital lobe. And within the green lobe, we have this structure, this area, known as the primary visual cortex. I told you it has about three names. We call it the primary visual cortex. Sometimes also referred to as area V1. And sometimes also known as the straight cortex. All right. So I said the function of the primary visual cortex is, no, is for conscious, conscious vision, conscious vision. And I said damage to um, the area V1 could lead to what kind of disorder? Okay, infinite notes, seven. Cortical blindness. Yeah, exactly, cortical blindness, cortical blindness. All right, so these are the things you need to know. All right. So what did we say when it comes to cortical blindness? Cortical blindness. Oh, please, let, let's be snappy about this and move on to the next one. Vivian, kindly go ahead. Can you unmute your mic and yes, speak? Sir. Yes, sir, please. I remember you said um, the damage is to the brain. Therefore. OK. Problem is not about the eye. You could see, but the Yes. All right, all right. So I remember I explained it that, take for instance, when someone has cortical blindness, okay, within maybe the left part of the brain, it means that the person can see, can't see what? Information at the right visual field. Because you know the right side is controlled by what? By the left part of the brain. So if the right, if the left what, um, area V1 is damaged, then it means that information from the right, the person wouldn't be able to what, see. That's what I mean by cortical blindness. So it means the damage or the blindness is due to what? It's due to the damage within the brain, not the eye. The eye is normal. It's functioning well. All right. So basically, these are some of the things you need to know when it comes to the lobe. So the next one that we'll be discussing is this. Mm. I hope you can see what I've projected, the two, the two brains. You can see them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good. OK. So um, when you open the brain, OK, basically, it looks like this. It has, to, you could see that it has been divided into two, two halves, right? You can see that it has been divided into two equal parts. This side. So there's a, a long line dividing it. And we call this long line 
longitudinal fissure. We call it longitude. We call it longitudinal fissure. That's it, longitudinal fissure. Okay, this when dividing their um their brain into two equal halves. We call it longitudinal fissure. And inside the longitudinal fissure, we have a structure. We have a structure known as corpus callosum. I'll show you the corpus callosum so that. Yes. So when, so when you watch, when you check the fissure inside it, we have a structure known as the corpus callosum. This is the corpus callosum. And the corpus callosum, its, its function is to what? Is to bind the two brains. So we call the two brains hemisphere. It binds the two hemispheres together. That's the function of the corpus callosum. It binds the two hemispheres together. That's the function of the corpus callosum. So let's see how, um, this, what makes up the corpus callosum. So when you check the corpus callosum, it's it very well. This is the corpus callosum. And you could see that it has some white, it is very, very white. When you see that the brain, when you, 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 what, you um, check the brain and you see that the brain is very, very whitish or some portions of the brain is very, very whitish, it tells you that that place contains a lot of myelinated axons. Right now, you know what myelinated axons are all about. It means it contains a lot of myelinated axons, making it very, very white. So we normally say that it has a lot of white matter. So in exams, they can ask you, a white matter consists of what? It consists of myelinated axons. So it means the corpus callosum has a lot of white matter due to the myelinated axons. All right. And whenever you check the brain and you also realize that the brain, some portions of it are gray, gray, G-R-E-Y. Okay, so it, so especially the, the lobes, the cortex of the lobes. Anyway. When I say the cortex of the lobes, I'm talking about this area. They are gray, telling you that it contains a lot of dendrite and cell bodies. It contains a lot of dendrite and what and cell bodies, leading to that. All right. So in exams, they can ask you a what a gray matter consists of what? It consists of dendrite and cell bodies. Then white matter consists of primarily consists of myelinated axons. So these are the distinctions. Okay. So as I said, the longitudinal fissure was divides the brain into two equal halves. So you could see that we have the left hemisphere, which is this. There's the left hemisphere, then there's the right hemisphere. And each hemisphere performs different functions. Each hemisphere performs different, different functions. So especially the left hemisphere performs what? Verbal, it's, it is primarily responsible for what? For um, verbal information. So for us to, for us to, to speak that, then it means that the left part of the brain is the one what's helping us to speak. Then we also have what? With the, left, with the right hemisphere, it is primarily responsible for what? For nonverbal information. So for you, to, for you to visualize something or have certain imaginations, tuitions, or sometimes you daydream and all that, it is due to your right hemisphere. Then with the left hemisphere, for you to speak, for you to think in words, for you to have some logics, even calculate, to make certain calculations, it is due to your left hemisphere. So these are the distinctions. You need to what? You need to know. So please, any questions so far?
Any question? Rashida. Rashida. So can we say that? Yeah. Can we say that the 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 right hemisphere is responsible for um, abstract thinking? Um. Uh, okay, to some extent, yeah. yeah. Because for you to visualize those things, it means that your right hemisphere is playing an important role. Yeah. All right, so um, I think that, that, that would be the only hand up, right? Okay, so let me, let me move on. Rashida, your hand is up again. Oh, right. I, I want that to... I wanted to move it down, please. Sorry. All right. So the next one, oh, Tracy. Okay, Tracy, your hand is up. Kindly go ahead. Um, so please, I wanted you to spell the structure we find. Inside of the Would you please repeat what you said again? Your voice is very low. Hello, Tracy. Okay. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Hello. Please, I wanted you to spell the structure you find inside the longitudinal fascia. Okay, okay. It's corpus callosum. That's corpus callosum. All right. So you could see that the brain has some, some wrinkles, right? You can, you can see the wrinkles. So we normally say that the brain has is composed of this, gyrus and sulcus. The, this, so this, these ones are the singular. The plural for gyrus is gyri. Then the plural for sulcus is sauci or saucy, any way that you want to pronounce it. Okay. Please say your line break down. Okay, so I'm saying that the um, brain, you can see that it, it has some wrinkles, some folds, right? You can see that it has some folds and indentations. So these folds and indentations are, they consist of structures known as gyrus and sulcus. The gyrus, its plural is gyri, then sulcus, its plural is um, saucy, okay? So when you check the structure, the convolution here, the fold here, you can see that there's a fold. Or let me see, this, this structure, it has been bored, or let me say it is more or less like a ridge. So that ridge is what is referred to as the sulcus, this. Or let's say this, this thing. So this side is what is referred to as the sul the gyrus. Then there's the sulcus, they are more or less like the lines, the lines within. the sulcus, these lines. So we call it indentations, okay? Or groups, G-R-O-O-V-E-S, groups. The lines there, they are what we normally say the sulcus or saucy. So the gyrus and the, sul and the sulcus are the ones that makes, that makes up what? The wrinkles, that makes the brain become a bit, a bit what? Wrinkled. Okay, so that's what basically you need to know. All right, Francis. Francis, unmute your mic and speak, please. All right, sir. Um, please, the gyrus and the circle doesn't have any function. They just make up the brain, okay? So when, when you open the brain like that, okay, it has 
this wrinkled ship. So the wrinkled ship, it means that it has the, the gyros and the, and, the, and the circles. Basically what okay. it, it means is that the gyros and the circles contains a lot of gray matter. All right. Okay, so, all right. All right, so thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so when you open, you remember I said when you open the brain, we have, before you get to the, before you get to the brain, when you open the skull, okay, we have certain structures. Um, with this diagram, you wouldn't see it well, but let me write them. We have certain structures that mix up the meninges. When you say meninges, it means that they are, they are structures or structures protecting the brain. Okay, so the moment you open the skull, you first see these structures. That's um, pia mater. Arachnoid membrane and dura mater. And dura mater. So the dura mater comes first, then arachnoid second, then the last layer is the pia mater in that order. Then, so you need to see these, layer, these layers first. After you've been able to what you've been able to move these layers, then the next structure will be the brain. That's what happens. All right. So we normally say that these three structures are normally referred to as meninges. Meninges. And you remember the, the last time I was telling you that um, we have um, certain fluids surrounding the brain, certain fluids surrounding the brain. So the, the blue, the blue um, thing that you see circulating, are the, they are the fluid that I'm talking about, the cerebrospinal fluid. That last time I said, you can see that it is what is surrounding the entire brain, the blue substance. That's the cerebrospinal fluid. And you can see that it extends to where? To the spinal cord. So this side is a spinal cord. So that's why I said the CSF surrounds both the brain and the spinal cord. Then it will come back to the brain in that order. And we all, I also made mention of the fact that we have what? We have ventricles and we have four main ventricles. Okay, so we have, we have the third ventricle the third ventricle, the fourth ventricle, then the lateral ventricles. The lateral ventricle, we can divide it into two parts. We have the left lateral ventricle and the right lateral ventricles. Okay, so I indicated to you that ventricles are basically what? Cavities or holes within the brain. So they are the ones that allow what? Allow the, the fluid to what? To, pass through, then it will go to where? To the spinal cord, then it will come back. So it allows the fluid what, to circulate around the brain and the spinal cord, so that there will be that sort of flow. Okay, so let me show you a diagram of what of the, yes. So this is basically the ventricles. So this, I'm not good when it comes to colors. I don't know whether this one is purple or what, whatever. So let's assume that it's purple. Okay. So this purple color is what? Is the cavity. They are cavities or holes within the brain. And their function is to allow the, C, the cerebrospinal fluid to, to pass through them. Then it will move to where? To the spinal cord. Then it will come back in that order. That's what happens. All right. So please, um, any question when it comes to what we've done so far? Because you know what the function of the spinal, the cerebrospinal fluid, you know what its function is and all that. All right, so any question? 
So my question to the class, what, what do you think, what's the function of the spinal cord? Sorry, there's cerebrospinal fluid. What's really happening? What's the function of the cerebrospinal fluid? All right, Tracy. Sir, it prevents from damaging. Would you please, would you please repeat what you said? It prevents the brain from damaging. Okay, so we normally say that it cushions the brain. It cushions the brain. All right, Francis, kindly go ahead. Okay. I wanted to say the same thing, like cushions the brain from damage. Okay, lovely. Yes, please. It produces no strength to the brain. Exactly, it nourishes the brain. Yeah, yeah. So any other, Godwin, do you have, okay, Vivian. Uh, say, okay. please, it prevents the brain from hitting the cranium. Okay, yeah, it's the same as someone saying it's what, it cushions or protects the brain, yeah. Okay, Benis, your hand is up. Please unmute your mic and speak. It removes waste from the brain. Okay, okay. So that's basically um, what the brain is all about. And I think we've what we've um, talked details when it comes to the others. Okay. So I think the last time um, we didn't talk about these things. We've talked about cere cerebellum right now. You know what the cerebellum is all about? the cerebellum. This, last time I said, we normally call it what? The little brain, right? So what's the function of the cerebellum? The cerebellum. I think someone even said it earlier. So someone said it is responsible for what? For balance and posture. Or, or sometimes in books, they wouldn't say balance and posture. They'll they will sometimes say it is responsible for, or it, it is responsible for motor coordination. It means the same thing. Sometimes too, the cerebellum plays a role when it comes to spatial activities. Okay. Then, apart from the cerebellum, we also discuss medulla, the medulla oblongata. Okay. And what did we say when it comes to the medulla? The medulla. So I remember someone indicated that with the medulla, it regulates what cardiovascular and what and respiratory activities. So these are the core function of the medulla. It regulates cardiovascular and respiratory what, activities. And someone says, so doesn't mean if your medulla is damaged, it doesn't mean you will die. Yes, because it plays an important role. Yet at the same time, it controls some reflex activities, whereby I said, when you sneeze, you cough or hiccup, all these things is due to your medulla. When you do that, it means your medulla is what is active, causing that. Then the pons. The pons, I indicated that it serves as a bridge. So why did I say the pons serves as a bridge? Who can explain why the pons serves as a bridge? Hello. Hello, sir. Emmanuel. Okay, go ahead. Hello. Yeah, Emmanuel. Yes, sir. Sir. Please go ahead. Are uh, you say the pons it transfer? It transfer information between the medulla and the cerebellum. Exactly, exactly. That's what you said. Yeah. It serves as a bridge. Exactly, exactly. So what I said was that when it comes to the pons, okay, it makes sure that um, information from the medulla, sorry, information from um, yes, the medulla and even the cerebellum moves to uh, to the higher cortexes, which is the cerebrum. I'm talking about the lobes. It moves to that aspect. So it means it connects information from the what from the from the medulla and what and this cerebellum 
to the cerebrum. When I say the cerebrum, it means I'm talking about the lobes. All right. And apart from it serving as a bridge, what other function does the pons? What other function do you, do you know when it comes to the pons? We talk about it. All right, Godwin. It also projects uh, contralateral information. Okay, so I remember I said, good, Godwin. So I said it connects one side of the body to the hemisphere in, in, a, what, in a contralateral manner. So I'm repeating, it connects one side of the body to the hemisphere in a contralateral manner, meaning that it makes sure that um, information from the left side of the body is controlled by what? By the right side of the brain or the right hemisphere. Then information from the right side of the body is controlled by the left what? Hemisphere. Then the same for, uh, for the other one, that's vice versa. Information from where? From the left side of the body is controlled by the right part of the brain. That's what it, it does. That's what I mean by contralateral. All right. All right. Then we also made mention of, of what? Of um, good. So I said these three structures: the cerebellum, medulla, and pons. We classify them as what? As diencephalon. You need to pay much attention. Diencephalon. Okay. Then. The last structure, which is also known as um, the midbrain. The midbrain. The midbrain, I said it has two main functions, it has two main parts, right? It has two main parts. That's the. Um, who remembers what I said when it comes to the midbrain? The two main parts of the midbrain. Oh, okay, Godwin, go ahead. The tectum and then uh, the tagmentum, which is the, the, the roof and then the ground. Okay, good. And the, tectum, a... and the tectum consists of what? It consists of the what? The inferior colliculi and the superior colliculi, right? Then the... Um, the tegmentum consists of what? Of the red nucleus and the substantia nigra. So you should know the functions of what of each. We've already discussed them. I said the inferior colliculi orient vision, then the superior the, the superior orient vision, then the inferior orient what? Auditory, right? Then I said with the what with the basal ganglia, it, it, it plays an important role or the substantia nigra, sorry, it plays an important role when it comes to what? Movement. So these are the things you need to watch, you need to know and all that. And one thing is the midbrain, the pons, medulla, and the cerebellum, we normally classify them as the brain stem. So when you say the brain stem, the midbrain, pons, medulla and cerebellum consist of it. But the moment we say, okay, diencephalon, it consists of pons, medulla and cerebellum. All right. Then the next thing is what? Is the pituitary gland. So you can see the pituitary gland closely attached to the hypothalamus. So this is the pituitary gland. Then this is the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus. This is the hypothalamus. So you can see the pituitary gland closely attached to the hypothalamus. And I think last time I didn't talk about the pituitary gland, but one thing you need to know is that with the pituitary gland, um, it is the it is it is part of the endocrine system that secretes hormone. It secretes hormone directly into the bloodstream. 
So we'll talk more when you, when you get to hormones and, and behavior. But in most situations, we normally say that the pituitary gland is the master gland. It is the master gland. So sometimes in exams, they can ask you, so what's the, which structure is referred to as the master gland? That's the pituitary gland. Why? Because it produces most of the hormones to different, to different what, parts of the body. For any hormone to be activated, it means that the pituitary gland needs to what needs to act on it. So that's why we normally say it is the master gland. All right. Then the next thing for us to do, or the next part, um, structure is what is the hypothalamus. So please, what did I say when it comes to the hypothalamus? Hypothalamus. Oh, please, let That's me start. That. Okay, go ahead. Um, someone was speaking. The person is in raise up his or her hand and has also unmuted. Has also muted himself. Okay, so your network is very bad. Lovely. I'm kindly go ahead. Sir, please, you said it regulates sexual performances. And what happened? It regulates a whole lot of activities. So, <laughs> apart from sexual activities, what happened? And it helps. So, okay, um, Teresa. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, it it helps us in eating behavior. Okay, so it and also it exactly. So it is it is involved in activities like eating, eating, drinking, temperature regulation, sexual activities, and so on. So it performs a lot of what a lot of function and even sleep. It regulates our sleep. All right. Then, then the last one is thalamus. The last one is thalamus. The thalamus, we normally say that it's, it is the relay station. It is the relay station, meaning that it's what? It projects information from the lower area to, uh, to the higher area, meaning that information from the, from the brainstem is projected to where? Uh, to the higher cortexes, that's the cerebrum. Sorry, I made I made a mistake. I said um, this medulla, cerebellum, and pons um, is the diencephalon. Sorry about that. Look, the mid the midbrain, medulla, and cerebellum um, consist of what of the brainstem. But when it comes to the diencephalon, it consists of the thalamus and the hypothalamus. That's one thing you should know. Sorry about that. The diencephalon consists of the thalamus and the hypothalamus. All right. So basically, that's 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 all when it comes to the brain structure. And I think we also talk about the subcortical structures, whereby we made mention of the limbic system. And the limbic system, we talk about amygdala, hippocampus, right? And I said the amygdala is responsible for what for emotions. Hippocampus is responsible for what? Memory. And we have other limbic structures. The mammillary what, body is also part of what? It's also part of the limbic system. The thalamus and the hypothalamus is also part of the limbic system. Okay. So basically, that will be all when it comes to brain and behavior. So please, any questions so far when it comes to brain and behavior? Any question when it comes to brain and behavior? Oh, nice. Then that means I can move on to, okay, Rashida, please go ahead. Sir, please, what did you say that um, hippocampus is responsible for, please? I said it's responsible for memory, memory. Thank you. You're welcome.
So that, move up, that means um, the next topic we'll be doing is, this one is which session? I could hardly see, okay. Let me see if, yeah. So the next session that we'll be doing is what is organization of the nervous system, which is the neuroplasticity last time we talk about. Neuroplasticity. So I think I remember in, in, in some cases when we were, we were discussing, um, oh, Samuel, Samuel, your hand is up. Samuel, please be snappy. Um, kindly unmute your mic and speak. All right, since Samuel is not ready, list the world. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, Good evening. Yes, sir. Please. Hello. Please go on, go on. Yes, sir. Um, yeah. Please, if a question is asked, which part of the brain is responsible for emotion? Um, and there is you? no amygdala. And there is no amygdala. Please, uh, excuse me, sir. And there is no amygdala. And there is hypothalamus. Which one should we take? Because there was a, I met a question like that when I was taking my... my uh, then it might be an error. There should be a amygdala. I don't. I don't know why. You. You. Because there's no way the hypothalamus could be what could be responsible for emotions. No. There was. A, there was a question like that. All right. So you let me go ahead. Okay. Sir. Thank you. Sir. So one thing is, I remember last time someone was asking. Okay. So what happens? when the brain gets damaged, does it um, heal itself and all that? And I told you, the brain is what? It's plastic in a sense that with time, okay, some of the, some of the neurons begins to, what, begins to develop or heal itself. And we normally say that plasticity is very, very high or is very, very effective among children. Why? Because when it comes to children, their brain are still what? Developing. Their brain are still developing. So it means when um, there's any damage, it heals what? Faster. So the other neurons what? Or other cells take up the role of what? Of the damage area. Then with time, the damage area would also what? Heal itself. All right. So during brain development, there are a whole lot of what issues that, go, that goes on, okay? Okay, Pinias, um, please, your hand is up. Yes, sir. Um, sir so in this sense, uh, how can we develop, uh, how can we define plasticity? Um, plasticity? I think you have this in, in your slide, I'm surprised. <laughs> Because I'm not here to um, spoon feed you with every, everything. You have them in your slides. So please revisit your slides and get what? And get what, um, defi whatever definition you, you want to what you want to, you want to use. Okay. Okay, so anyone anyone can define it. Okay, you let's discuss this. Someone should define plasticity. Let me see. Hello. Or oh, you are still waiting for me to define plasticity for you? Or well, sometimes you find it in book neuroplasticity. All right. Okay, Randy. Okay. Yes, sir. Good evening. Please go ahead. Uh, and the neuroplasticity. Okay. The ability of the brain to change a better or for way. Um, okay, or that's life. what you can find in your in your slides, right? So yes, sir. Yeah, so it means that the ability of the brain to uh, to change or adapt. 
due to what? Exactly. Due to um, damage or certain mental... experience. Yes, or certain experiences. That's it. So the ability of the brain to change and adapt due to damage okay. or certain environmental what? Experiences. That's it. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Any other person? Someone's hand is up again, or it's by mistake. Randy. Randy. Yes, sir. Right. Sorry, sir. After answering, I, I forgot to. Okay, 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 okay. So right. we have during brain development, there are certain what certain um indicators that happen. Okay, so um, we have something known as um, proliferation. Let me see if I can find them in here. Give you very, very short. Okay. So during brain de development, there's something known as proliferation. I would type it for you so that you would, where is the annotation bar? Mm -hmm. Proliferation. Then after proliferation, we move on to migration, then in that order. So we will explain them. So ha has any of you come up with um, what proliferation is all about? Or this is the first time you are, you are hearing proliferation? Any of you come up, uh, have come, uh, any of you know what pro proliferation is all about? Proliferation. All right, so basically we normally say that with proliferation, okay, it is the time it is the time the cell begins to uh, begins to develop. Especially you could see that the neurons begins to uh, begins to develop. So during the prenatal stage, or yes, when the baby is in the mother's womb and everything, you can see that there, there's what well, development. It starts from proliferation, whereby the cells begins to what begins to develop, especially the neurons and all that. The dendrite will what will grow, then what the cell bodies and so on. They'll begin to what grow. So first it starts with the cell body because that's the nucleus, then it comes the dendrite, then the axon will what will develop. So in the course of that sort of development, we call it what proliferation. Okay, then with time, there will be what? Migration. Migration. So I think with that, you can find it here, neuronal migration. Migration, it happens whereby you, the axons what? Travels to its target area, especially. So let's say um, there has been some development happened. That's the proliferation. There has been some development. With time, the axon would then what would then move to its target area. So maybe the axon will directly move to maybe the hippocampus. That's what we mean by it will be extended to the hippocampus. So its traveling is what is referred to as migration. It comes from the term to migrate. Migration. Hey. Okay. So please, any questions so far? Any question? All right, Rashida. So with the uh, proliferation, is it with the zygote or the fetus? Is it with what? Like does it come, as you said, it, it starts when the, uh, there's development in the brain from, in, in the mother's womb. So like I'm asking, is it, does it happen when the baby or um, the, the, is it, 
like a zygote or a fetus? Does it is it at the fetus stage or the when is it like a zygote? That well, this thing happens. Fetal stage and the fetal stage that would be when you, you could see that okay, it is what it is developing and all that. Because at the fetal stage, okay, the uh, you you can see that you can see it in a in a human form or something. Let me put it in that fashion. But at that point, there's what there's development going on. Tissues are are being developed and all that. So at that point, neurons, especially, are being what are being de de developed. Okay, Pinias, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, please. My question is: um, Can there be an instance where, in the course of the migration, uh, um, uh, any of the cell can get to a wrong destination? Um, with that, I don't know, but I think maybe it's it's possible. It's possible. But what happens is that since the the young the child is what is young, even when it gets to wrong destinations, destination, sorry, it naturally prunes out those what those um areas. Okay. The brain okay, the brain has you. been devised okay. in such a way that it naturally prunes the unwanted what um development junctions and, and all that. When it doesn't, when it, it, it doesn't happen like that, then it means that it could lead to certain disorders and all that. Especially with this, um, there's an evidence to support that people with autism, it means that they have a lot of what, a lot of um, unwanted what? Axons or neurons. So prune, during that time, a lot of pruning didn't happen leading to what leading to that sort of disorder okay francis yes sir please um does it mean migration only occurs in children you say you're saying does it mean migration only occurs in children to a large extent yes because at that time the brain is still developing so the Neurons are what are moving to its target what areas. So in the course of it moving to its target areas, migration is what is happening for that to happen. The only time maybe in our in our in our case migration could happen, um, could be maybe when there's a, a damage or something. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. So the last stage is synaptogenesis. So under synaptogenesis, it comes from what you, you basically know, that synapse. So the last stage, the last point, when it comes to the brain development is synaptogenesis, whereby the child will begin to, what, will begin to develop synapses, that space within the, within the various neurons. So there'll be what gaps or space within the, the various neurons that sign up to genesis. So that's the last stage of what of brain development. All right. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Um, Randy. Hello, sir. Hey. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, um, let me. Yes. During preparation to my migration, like Randy. Uh, Randy, sorry. Would you please time. amplify your voice a bit? Sorry. Hello. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you now. Yes. Um, in a follow-up to the last question. Um, as when he asks whether proliferation happens in only when the brain is forming, when the okay. brain damage and the the it's the brain is healing and the cells are forming again, is there yeah. proliferation happen again? Uh huh. So when when the, when when there is damage and maybe the the brain is the brain is healing and new cells are being produced, will my migration happen again? Yeah, that's, what I, that's what I said. I said it only happens when 
maybe there's a cell, a cell what a cell damage and especially other cells want to take up the role of what of the damaged cell then it means they need to migrate to that area that's only that's the only time migration could what could happen by in, most situations in yes in adults by most yeah, situations yeah. migration happens a lot in what in, in children because at that time their brain are still what developing Right, right. Okay, Thank Phineas. You. Yes, sir. Um, um, I also want to find out with synaptogenesis, does it start from the womb? Does it start from where? The womb. Uh, not necessarily, because that's the last stage, and when the baby is born, at that time, the, 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 the brain is still what? It's still developing. So it means um, there's a high possibility that synapses, a lot of synapses will not be formed, okay? Until the baby what? Um, grows up. They have, um, I've forgotten um, the exact age. So you can search, I, I don't want to give you wrong information. So search for the, um, the exact age brain development stops. So that would be the point you can say that there's no what brain development. And I said the last development within the brain is what? A synapse, development of synapse. That's the last stage. So it means that synapses are formed at the latter part of what? Of um, brain development. Okay. So please, any other question? Okay, and so yes, I came across something before the sign up to Genesis. There's also something known as um, myelination. Okay, myelination. So myelination also happens during brain development. So after migration, then the next one is what is myelination, whereby it comes from. You, you should know this. I, I, I don't even need to need to talk about this. So when you say myelination, what do you think will happen? Please, in case you know, you can raise up your hand. Myelination. The name itself should give you a clue. So please, Rashida. So I'm trying. I don't know. But I'm trying. My lines are formed. Exactly. Myelination means, that means myelin. So it means at that point in time, there will be development of what? Of myelin sheet. So some fatty substances will what? Will be coated around the axons. That's myelin. All right. Teresa. Teresa, your hand is up. All right. So let me move on. Since maybe you mistakenly raise up your hand. Okay, Francis, your hand is up. Yes. Uh, um, please, according to Google, it says um, a brain development ends at um, age 25. Age 25. Oh, okay. Okay, so it means that yes. some, some of you are at this point in time, still your brains are, are still developing. That's what happens. And at that time, if yeah. unfortunately there's any injuries or whatsoever, there's a high tendency that you you recover very fast as compared to someone who is maybe 60 years or 70 years. All right. Sure. Yeah, okay. Okay, Francis, your hand is up again. All right. So let me walk you through some of the things that happens during um, plasticity. So when there's a damage, okay, we have a section known as, we have something known as um, axonal sprouting. 
So these are some of the um, things that happens. When we say axon sprouting, it means that there's a, there's a damage within the axons. Then afterwards, with time, the axon will what? Will grow. So it means axon sprouting is about the, uh, the development of what? Of a damaged axon. That's one form of what? Of plastic, plasticity. We call it axon sprouting. Axon sprouting is about the development of what? Of a damaged axon. And the next one is something known as collateral sprouting. I'm trying to get a diagram for you so that I can use it to explain the collateral sprouting so that you, you grasp it well. So um, let me project this. A typical collateral sprouting is this. So let's, the first structure that you see is a healthy neuron. This structure is a health, so you can see that we have neuron number one, then neuron number two, so this is the axon. Okay, then unfortunately, this neuron gets damaged. So you can see that the second, the second um, structure, this neuron is damaged. What happens is that the neuron, which is what, which is adjacent to, uh, to the, I'm talking about this healthy neuron, which is adjacent to, uh, to the damaged neuron. What does it do? It will then what? It will then develop another what? Another axon to take up its role. So you can see that this uh, this uh, healthy axon just what? Just developed another axon to take up the role of what? Of this neuron. That's what happens. So let me repeat it. Let me start everything afresh so that. So we have two different, two healthy what? Neuron. Here. Then unfortunately, this neuron number two got damaged. So that's the second what the diagram. This, this neuron number two is damaged. When that happens, the healthy axon or the healthy neuron, which is close to the what the damaged neuron begins to sprout another what? Neuron to take up the role of the damaged neuron. So that's what is happening here when it comes to this diagram. You can see that this healthy what? Healthy neuron has sprouted another axon to what? To take up the role of a damaged axon. That's what happens. So when that happens, then it means that collateral sprouting has taken place. I hope you get it. You get it. So please, if you have any question, um, kindly use the emoji to raise up your hand when it comes to collateral sprouting. All right, Lovelet, please go ahead. Sir, please, can you go over it again? Okay. The collateral sprouting. The collateral sprouting, no problem, I'll, I'll go over it. I'll go over it. So what I said was that, um, let me, I'm saying with the collateral sprouting, in most situations, the healthy neuron, which is close to the damaged neuron, 
begins to take up the role of what? Of the damaged neuron. So this diagram, for instance, we have neuron number one, that's eight axon. Then neuron number two, also eight axon. Then unfortunately for neuron number two, the axon, so when you check this side, you can see that it is quite what it is, it is quite um, darkish, telling you that, okay, this neuron number one, it axon has been what, has been damaged. When it happens like that, this healthy axon, which is close to the damaged axon, begins to what, begins to develop another neuron or another axon to take up what? The role of the damage. So it means this thing will sprout another what? Axon to take up the role of the damage one. That's what basically collateral sprouting is all about. So it means with collateral sprouting, the healthy axon, which is close to the damage what? Axon begins to what? Sprout another axon to take up the function of the damage axon, that's it. All right, Rashida. So I wanted to find out that what if the terminals got damaged or those ones don't get damaged? What if the terminals? Yes, oh yes, the when the terminal, terminal. Yes, when the axon terminals get damaged, yes, it can also sprout. The only time okay. The only time um, the the neuron would what would damage automatically is when the cell body gets damaged. Why do you think? Why do you think when the cell damage? Sorry, why do you think when the cell body gets damaged, then it means that axon will die out? Why? Anyone has a, an idea? You can just try, Rashida. That's where the life of the neuron is. Exactly. So what's, what's, the, name for, what's the name of it? The life that you're you are talking about? The cell body. Yes. It has the that. nucleus is there. Exactly. So That's where the nucleus is. So the moment it gets damaged, then it means that the cell would automatically what? Or the neuron would automatically die. All right. So that's all when it comes to collateral sprouting. Rashida, your hand is up. I'm just saying, like, just the tree. When you cut the trees, you know, some of the branches, they can come again, you know. So uh -huh. just, just having that analogy. Exactly. Okay. Good. Thank you. So in most situations, Phineas. Sorry. Sorry. I, sorry. Hello. Okay, Johnson. Go ahead. Yeah, Rashida, so that's uh, an uh, analogy. I didn't get it. She said, she said, a uh, tree branch. When one is uh, cut, it will, it will, it will come back again. But in this yes. case, uh, the, the other axon is taking over the damaged one. Okay. Okay. So, so the think... tree branch when. Okay. <laughs> Please go ahead, Johnson. Sorry, you lied. Uh, the tree branch, when, when, when one is damaged, the other branch cannot take over to repair the damaged one. Yes, I think. Um, so you get my point. I, 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 get, I totally get your point. I think um, Rashida was yes. just generalizing it. Like when it comes to plasticity, that's what happens. Yeah. Yes, so I think her, her argument will basically fit well when we say, when we talk about axonal sprouting whereby the damaged axon in itself would what? Will grow by itself. It means that no, no other neuron beside it will what? Will take up the role, but it would just what? Grow yeah, yeah, yeah. by itself. Yeah. All right. So um, I was saying that we have some, okay, sorry, Pinias, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Um, I also want to find out is when the axons um, um, dies off and then um, an axon will, 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 will grow or to take up the role of the dead axon. What, what about um, a cell body, a whole cell body dying off? 
will another cell body also take up the place and the role of I have already answered this. So it means that you weren't paying attention when I said it. So please, someone should answer Pineas. Say so his question again. <laughs> so Pineas, please go ahead with your question. I've already answered this, so I'm surprised. Okay. Um, my question is, you know, when an axon terminal dies, um, a different axon, the, the closest axon terminal grows up an axon to take over the, the role of the dead axon. So my question is, in this case, what if a cell, a whole cell dies and, and, and the, the other cells that remains, would they also take over the role of the dead cell or the dead neuron? You're talking about the entire de dead cell. I thought you said the cell body. No, sir. When it comes to the cell, it means then it means that uh, no, no other neuron would. Okay, what happens is that that cell in itself it is it has died out, right? So it means automatically other what other neurons would begin to what would begin to sprout and take up the role, definitely. But what happens? So, for instance, let's say um, you have a structure within what within the hippocampus. Let's talk about the hippocampus. Okay, then uh, the entire cell dies out. The entire hippocampus dies out. Then it means that with time, other structures surrounding the hippocampus will begin to will begin to take up certain roles, step by step. That's what that's what happens. Especially when you take um, epilepsy. Let me use that as a, as a typical example. Epilepsy. Sometimes what surgeons do is that they take what? Large cortex of what? Of the patient, especially if the person is what? Is very young. And the reason as to why they do that is that they know for sure that children, their brain is very what? Plastic. So even when they take some portions of the brain out with time what happens the brain will begin to heal itself it begins to what develop so it means other cells will take up the role of what of the the area that was what that was that was um um that they, that they, that they took out that's what happens so it all depends on the person's age when they the person is very young, then it means recovery becomes quite what faster. So, and for the for the brain to what to also recover, then it means the person needs to go through a whole lot of rehab, rehabilitation. So that's why stroke patients or people who experience um, traumatic brain injury, that's accident. What do they do? We have in the hospital, we have what a rehabilitation unit whereby they need to go there frequently. They need to exercise their muscles. When you are exercising your muscles, it means that certain areas within your what, within your brain begins to what, begins to heal step, step by step, or certain tissues are developed in bits. So it means rehab, you need to be consistent so that your brain would what, would recover. All right. So please, any, any question? Any other question? Daniel. Um, so I want to ask if the, the that um, axon which is there, and then we have the closest one replacing it, uh, is it going to affect the performance or the work of that particular one which is dead or no, they are going to have no. it will perform it will perform it perfectly okay it will perform it perfect without any what without any um interferences interference from no yeah yeah okay all right sir all right so um let's see what 
So right now, um, I'm moving on to the next one, the next um, session, which is session six, genes and behavior. We wouldn't be able to do everything when it comes to genes and behavior. Okay, two people. Daniel, okay, I've already answered you. So, Francis. Yes, sir. Um, please, is it possible for an exercise, any form of exercise to damage the neurons? Any form of exercise to what? To damage a neuron? Yeah, can we, can we get, can our, our neurons be damaged uh, due to an exercise or something? Exercise. Unless maybe, maybe you doing the exercise, unfortunately, you had um, maybe a, con a concussion or some objects what? Yes, or you hit your head with an object or something. But you doing normal okay. exercise without, um, you doing normal exercise and your, your, or your brain not what, not um, being hit by any object or whatsoever. I don't think it will, cause, it will cause any damage. Exercise, normal exercise wouldn't cause that. It wouldn't cause okay. that. If in normal exercise, okay. you doing it, it what? It um, develops a lot of what? A lot of tissues within your primary motor cortex. You know, for instance, when you are what? When you, maybe you are jogging or walking, it means that your motor cortex is also what? It's also developing a lot of tissues because that's what is helping you to what? To initiate movement. You remember I said the primary motor cortex is re responsible for voluntary what movement so it means when you do it you are jamming it's more or less like you're also jamming your what your brain and yet at the same time okay. that's why you normally say that oh you need to read it a lot when you read a lot it means your your um brain is developing a lot of what a lot of tissues within the area responsible for memory that's your hippocampus okay all right. Okay, sir. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. So um, the next session we'll be doing, I said I wouldn't be able to what I wouldn't be able to treat all of them, but I think we'll do some few things under it. Then God willing, next week we can continue. We can continue. So the next thing we'll be doing is what? Is brain and behavior. Brain and behavior. And under brain and behavior, we normally... So during a spare time, you can what? You can read about Mendelian um, inheritance law. Also Mendelian, he conducted some studies, okay? And what he did was that he crossed a purebred white flower with a purple flower. And at the end of the day, he had a mix of what? Of the two. When he was, he crossed them. He had a mix. So out of it, he began to what? He began to wonder what is really happening. So this is what happens. And in most situations, when it comes to genetics, we have two, two key things. Um, where is my annotation? Good. We have the capital one. Whenever you see a genetic code with a cap, with a cap and a small letter, it means two things. The cap tells you that that gene is what? Is dominant. Then the small letter tells you that it is recessive. I would, would explain all the terms later. But for now, when you see a capital letter when it comes to genetics, it means that that gene is what? Is dominant. Then the small letter, when you see it means that gene is recessive. We'll explain them later. I just want to introduce you to 
these things for the meantime. We'll explain what a dominant and a recessive gene is all about. So when it comes to genes, so one, one would say, so what is basically genes? So remember when we were talking about um, cell bodies, we said the nucleus is what? Some, someone used a term, I, I think Rashida, Rashida, she said in most situations, it is the, the life of what? Of, of the cell. We saying it is the life of the cell, it means that cell body contains what? The genetic code of what? Of, of us. And these genes, they are passed from our parents to the other. So it means that the color of the eyes that you have, the color of the hair, your height, and so on and so forth, and so forth you inherited these things. They are all what? genetic codes, genes within us that we inherited from either our parents or from either our mother or our father. So genes basically, they, they contain what? Some chromosomes. And chromosomes, they are composed of some protein substances known as DNA, that's deoxyribonucleic acid. Deoxyribonucleic acid, that's DNA. It consists of, DNA makes up what? Chromosome, okay? Then, under DNA, we have ribonucleic acid. That's the protein substance. So it means it starts from RNA, which is ribonucleic acid, then we have DNA, then within the DNA, we can have what? A chromosome in a cell. Okay. So as I said, RNA is what? They, they have somewhat some proteins. They are more or less like protein substances within it. So these are the key terms you need to, oh, sorry. Sorry, someone's hand is up. Rashida, Rashida, go ahead. Sir, can you please go, go over the genes? The genes. Like Which area? The, uh, DNA, the, the genes contain the chromosomes in them. So first, for us to have any genes or whatsoever, okay, it starts from the fact that we have RNA, that's ribonucleic acid. They are protein substances that are synthesized, okay? Then out of it, we we'll generate what is referred to as the DNA. So that's why some people, um, whenever they want to do any paternity test or whatsoever, they will say, okay, then we need to, what we need, we need to do a DNA test. Because the genes, Within the genes, we have what? DNA. The DNA is what makes up the gene. Okay? The DNA is what makes up the gene. So it starts from the RNA, which is the ribonucleic acid. Then out of it, we will get a model known as DNA. And all these things are protein substances that are, that are, that are synthesized together for us to have the gene. Okay, so Rashida, I hope it is well understood now. Yes, please. All right. But what about the chromosomes? We will talk about them later because the chromosome is the big umbrella. We have several what chromosomes. Then out of it, we have these genes. So in hum human, for instance, every human has 23 pairs of chromosomes. I'm saying 23 pairs. Pairs, meaning that in all, every human have, have, have what? 46 chromosomes. 
Okay. So we normally say that the first 22 pairs, the first 22 pairs of chromosomes, we call, we call them what? Autosomes. Then the 23rd pair is what is referred to as sex chromosomes. And the sex chromosome is what it determines whether someone will be what? A male or a female. So from my cultural context, I know um, gender, or let me say sex to be what? To be in two, in two fashion. That's whether you're a male or female, that's gender. So for us to determine that, okay, this person is what? It's a male or this person is a female, it is due to what the sex chromosome. It is what determines whether one should be a male or a female. So we'll discuss more later. We'll discuss more later. Okay. So these are some of the terms you need to what you need to know. Alleles, homozygotes, then heterozygotes and so on. So the first one we'll discuss is what? It's alleles, it's alleles. So basically that's the definition, but what you need to know is that with alleles, it means it helps us to know the various categories under a particular um, gene. So for instance, if for us to say that, okay, someone, for, for us to say height, Height. It means that height has two allelic pairs. Whether the person is what is tall or what or short. So we say someone is tall or short is the the allelic pair we are talking about or the alleles we are talking about. It means height has two alleles. Whether you are short or tall, then weight the same thing. Big, thin, all right, or fat, thin, sorry. So these are the things you need to know. Then we have homozygotic or homozygote. So with homozygote, it contains only one allele of the pair. You know one allele, when you say one allele, then it means that the homozygote contains only one portion of it, whether tallness, tall. So for us to say that someone is tall, then it means that the person has this genetic code. Oh, where is it? Big T, two big T. And remember I said in genetics, when you see a, a capital letter, it means what? So it means, good. It means, so it means good. So it means homozygote, homozygote implies that you have two what dominant genes or two recessive genes. That's a small what letters. Then we can say that this one is what is a homozygotic gene. But with heterozygotic gene, it means it has one pair of what of each genetic of of each of the genetic pair it has one recessive gene it has one what dominant gene then we can say this chromosome is what it's more or less like a heterozygotic gene all right so please any question when it comes to homozygote and heterozygote any questions so far? Daniel. Yes, uh, so please, the differences or the similarity between the alleles and then heter heterozygotes or so, heterozygotes. Yeah. Uh, yes, because for the homozygotes, I, I think it's clear. 
Okay, so with the alleles, it has to do with the fact that we are just looking out for the categories within, let's say, an allele for height or an allele for weight. So weight, for instance, we know for sure that we have only two categories. That's the allele we are talking about. Two categories, whether the person is what? Is tall. Whether this person is tall. So we are just looking out for the tallness and the shortness. So the tallness and the shortness mix up what? The alleles we want, we are talking about. So the alleles is basically about the categories of what? Of, um, the various categories within maybe uh, maybe height or within what weight or within color of the eye so within the color of the eye we can have what black brown green and so on so the black brown green and so on is what is referred to as the alleles so please do you get it now Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Rashida. Yes, uh, assuming that um, one picks an allele of, let's say, uh, uh, like the heterozygote, does it mean that you, you'll be medium height? Let's say you have the allele for height. <laughs> you be um medium medium height as in let's say you you you, you <laughs> or or you be i don't get it. like you in pick genes, the one, gen one gene from one one pill and then <laughs> i i totally get, get where you're coming from <laughs> that's okay we do have when it comes to height doesn't mean we don't have maybe um an allele known as medium height when it comes to we, we normally use the extremes, whether you're, you are what, you are short or you're what, you are tall. So you're talking about medium height, you might be categorized as what, as short, as being short. So in terms of alleles, it's more or less like, it's about whether you, it's about the shortness or the tallness. There's no mid middle ground. That's one thing you should know. All right. Then the next terminology you need to know is what genotype. So the genetic codes we are talking about, okay. So when you say tall, tallness, okay. The per we're saying that for us to say that someone is tall, it means the person has a, a, gene, a gene of what? Of either TT, the big TTs. Or one T, small T, that makes up tallness. So this code is what is referred to as the genotype. So the full genetic code of what of individuals. Weight has its own what genetic code. Height also has its own genetic code. So the genetic codes for each um, composition is what is referred to as genotype. So with genotype, we can't see it until we use what we use certain what machines to what to uh, test the genetic code of what of each individual, whether the person is short and so on and so forth. But with phenotype, it is the physical what characteristics that we see. So for instance, we knowing that oh the person has a genetic code of what of TT. The genetic code will tell us that, oh, TT, it means the person is what? Is tall. For us to know that, oh, this person is tall, we can, well, we can see for sure that, oh, the person is tall. So we're seeing it is what is referred to as the phenotype, the physical features or appearance of the person is what is referred to as the phenotype. Then we, what? We using certain, what, certain uh, machines to check the gene code of the person to know that, oh, this person is tall. So it means this their gene code will be maybe two dominant gene or 
one dominant gene and one recessive gene is what is referred to as the genotype of the person. Okay, then we normally say that with, gen with dominant gene, when there's a dominant gene in any what, in any genotype, it means that that do dominant gene would, would be what, would be highly expressed. So it means the dominant gene would overshadow the recessive gene. So for instance, when you take this hetero heterozygotic gene, that's one with small t and one with big T, always the big T will be expressed. It means this dominant gene will be expressed. It means no matter what the person will be what will be tall, irrespective of the fact that we have one recessive gene in there. So the only time the recessive gene will be expressed is when we have two recessive gene. So when we have two recessive gene, then it means that the recessive gene will be what will be highly expressed. It means it will tell us that, okay, this person is what is short. The same thing applies to other, what, other categories. Let's say um, the, the genetic code for height is H. We have then one person has what? Two HH. It means that we have two dominant genes telling us that, oh, this person is what? It's tall. No, that means I'm using the same thing. So let's say that um, the genetic code for weight is what? Is W. So big W, this person has two big W telling us that, oh, the person is what? Is very, very fat. That's what it implies. But in situations whereby someone has small W, one small W, and one big W, it means that even though the person has one small W, the big W there, which is the dominant gene, is telling us that still the person is what? Is fat. But the only time we can say that, oh, the person is what? Is thin. Is whereby the person has what? Two small Ws. It means the person has two recessive genes. When that happens, then it means nobody, no um, genetic code or um, would overshadow the other. So it means the person will be what? Will be thin. That's what, that's how we, what we interpret these genetic codes. So please, any question? Any question? All right. If there's no question, then I think um, that will be the end of today's discussion. Or you let me you let me land. Let me make sure that I'm done with this side. Then we can what we can. Beatrice, please go ahead. Um, so please, can um, medication affect genes? Can medication affect genes? So what? Uh, is, is it because of... Um, yes, please. <laughs> Interesting. One thing is, it's been difficult for you to change your what? Your genotype. Okay? There's no way you can what you can change your genotype. Like okay, you changing your height from it being TT to two big TT to uh, two okay one one big T and small T. You can't change it. Your genotype will remain what the same. Just that okay, so. certain environment, just that due to environmental factors, some people can change their, what, their phenotype, their physical characteristics. So for instance, if the person is what, has a genotype for, in terms of weight, if the person genotype is what, is two dominant what, genes, the person could what, could change his or her phenotype by what, by exercising, or what, or taking certain medications to what to 
decrease their fatness. Fine. But yet at the same time, the person's what genotype will remain the same thing. There's no way it will change. All right. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Johnson. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Sir, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to know if uh, two short parents give uh -huh. birth to a tall, give birth, birth to tall children, or two tall um, parents give birth to short children. Is it normal? Uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> when it comes to um, the tallness, fine. We can explain it by using this. You know, for it could be that both parents they are hetero what heterozygotic, right? When they are heterozygotic, it means they have one what one dominant gene and one what recessive gene. Okay, so since they have a recessive gene in there, even though they are tall, you know, I said. If you have to, if you have um, a heterozygotic gene, it means that always the dominant gene will overshadow the recessive gene. So it means still the person will be tall. Okay, okay. but there's a high possibility that maybe they might what get a kid who will be what who will be short because they have somewhat some recessive gene for tallness there. I hope you get it. But with yes, please. Um, but with um someone both parents being short very short they getting what a tall person is is highly improbable because for us to have shortness it means that they all have what two recessive gene and you having two recessive gene there's no way you can have what a dominant gene or whatsoever anywhere so it is highly improbable for that thing to happen Okay, sir, sir, so when it happens, do you have to ask questions? Yeah, and then um, with that, it all boils down to questions. But one thing is, in, in terms of um, phenotype, you need to be quite cautious. It could be that you might, you might perceive the person as what, as short. But when you check the person's what, genotype, it's not like that. So it means the genotype doesn't categorize the person as short. It means the person is tall. So it means in gene in genetics for us to what for us to make any conclude come up with any conclusive evidence it all boils down to you checking the phenotype to see whether the phenotype is what is two small T's or they have some portions of what of dominant gene in there you can't just use the um, the phenotype the physical characteristics and what and conclude. All right. Okay, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So I think um, that will be the end of um, today's discussion. Godwin, Godwin, your hand is up. Yes, sir. Please, I would like to know whether it can be possible for two white people to give birth to a black child. Ah. Uh, as. It depends. Maybe um, yeah, we, then it means we need to trace their what their um, their generation. It could be that they had what they, that sort of generation had, um, or their great great grandparent or whatever was what was a black. It sometimes happens, you know, due to um. Urbanization and also migration and all that. What happens? We crossbreed. So there's a high possibility that okay, a black guy and what and a, and a white lady could what could cross, get what get a white person. Then out of it, with time, um, the new new generation would also get what a black person from it because of the crossbreed breeding that happened. So unless we trace, you need to trace to find out whether um, that person, their generation had a black person in there. When they had a black, so if they have, a, they could trace that, okay, the person 
half and maybe a black what a black um great grandparent then it means they to some extent also have that sort of what that sort of black um pigments in them all right oh okay daniel um you'll be the last person then we'll be done for today oh, okay sir so uh, i want to talk about the the sex chromosome which you say is the 23rd one yeah now when I, I hope it determines the either the person will be a female or a male yeah that's what i said okay now that will be based on the sex organ of the individual uh-huh what is the yes, so on the sex organ of whom on the sex organ of whom is it the parents or what individual, like yeah i hope it's the sex organ that is used to determine whether a person is a female or a male um we'll come to that i'm saying when it comes to genes we are using the gen the genetic code not the physical characteristics of the person okay not the phenotype we are All looking right. out for the genotype so we will we will we'll discuss more god willing next week on the all right sir. Thank all you. right okay so then that will be the end of today's um discussion so so let me say this um i'm trying to do something i'm trying to move everything all the videos that um i have up, um i recorded okay i'll mount everything onto youtube so you have a big platform on youtube i'll send you okay my channel you'll go there and what and view them i think that that would be much better So whatever video that I'll, I'll be recording, okay. it'll be what? It'll be forwarded to YouTube. You go there and watch okay, sir. and view. And also please subscribe to the channel. Okay, sir. All right. So I'm trying to, uh, okay, sir. I've been able to upload about two of them. I want to... Please come again. So I have, I have, I've, I've been able to upload two of the videos. I'm still what uploading them. So when I'm done with everything, I'll just circulate it on the WhatsApp platform for all of you, so that you can go there and watch and watch all the videos during your spare time. I think that one will be better for you guys. All right. Okay. So talking on the WhatsApp. Platform. Uh huh. You're not on the WhatsApp platform. Some of us are still not. No. I remember last yes, time. Please, if they have created anything, they should join some of us. We have told them, but on more country. Wow, well, because I have. When it comes to that, there's nothing I can do. I have no control over it. I remember I told you, uh, Richard, last week, Richard was forwarded his contact on this platform for you to work, for you to. Um, send him a message or something. Or else, okay, the alternative I can do is that I can also forward um, the link to uh, to um, Sakai. So to be on Sakai and also on the WhatsApp platform. Yes. Yeah, so that all of you can benefit. That would be best. If the link, if the link is on Sakai, that would, that would be nice. Okay, all right. So please have a wonderful evening and see you god willing next week you too bye 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 bye, bye. bye.